joining together to do these joint hearings. Uh, Chairman Albers is here and he's on my right. Um, and so we'll be conducting these meetings together. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, first thing I'd like to make sure everybody's aware of, that we'll be operating off of the governor's budget books. So I know each, each chamber has a, a track sheet that we use, but today, because of the joint meetings, we're going to operate off the budget books. So if you have those, we'll try to, I'll try to guide you through by going to the pages for you. And since we're going to be preparing in just a few minutes to start up, we'll begin with prosecuting attorneys council, um, and that's on page 47. Um, that's where the meat and potatoes kind of begins for them in your in your budget, in your amended budget. So the, the little budget, if you will, uh, is that one. And uh, Chairman Albers, if you'd like to say anything, I want to go ahead and give you an opportunity to, to welcome everyone. Thank you, Chairman Walsh. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for being here first thing in the morning. I uh, look forward to seeing uh, all those who would do so much for our state. Uh, and I know this will be an excellent process uh, as we get moving on a bit of an abbreviated schedule uh, as we've done in years past. So uh, I know that uh, follow-ups in this meeting will require one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings uh, with some of us, and we look forward to scheduling them uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, Chairman Walsh. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just as a preliminary, I want to make sure we kind of see roll here. I've got... Um, from our committee, I've got Alex Atwood is here, Dusty Hightower, you are here, Mandy Ballinger, you're here, I'm present, Judge, you're here, Christian, I saw you come in, um, is Representative Evans, I know she's going to try to make it, I don't see her here yet, Bill Hitchens is here, um, and Terry Rogers, you are here, um, am I missing anyone? Al, where's Al? Well, I'm just taking roll for those that are present right now. So I'm sure he'll show up in a little bit. Uh, all the rest of the members, I'm sure, will be here in a little while. Um, thank you for being here so early in the morning. We just got we have a lot to do, a uh, short time to do it. The good thing is that the, the amended budget is uh, fairly um, innocuous in terms of the changes made, but we'll go through those. Um, Spayhaus, we're happy to have you here this morning. If you would just kindly introduce everyone that's here with you and then go ahead and proceed. 15 minutes, please. Okay. Again, I'm Chuck Spayhaus. I'm the executive director of the Prosecutor Attorney's Council. Seated to the side is David Miller. He is the district attorney in the Southern Circuit from our uh, warmer part of the state than we're in today. And to the left is, of course, Danny Porter, the DA from Gwinnett County. Um, as you said, we're working off of page 47 of the governor's budget. Uh, the presentation is in this format, so this is what we were working off of to kind of walk you through that. Um, our first slide, of course, is just the mission statement of the Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Basically, we are the state agency charged with supporting the prosecutors of the state in their, uh, in their efforts to combat crime. The first um, quick slide is about the accountability court assistant DAs. As you know, in the previous three years, we have been allocated uh, a group of assistant DAs, and each year this map shows where we've actually allocated those based on the existence of accountability courts. There were 12 and 14. 15 additional in 15 and then 10 that were allocated last year that'll become relevant in the 17 budget but that just kind of gives you an idea and a, and a picture of what we have accomplished in this state with accountability courts the next slide deals with 15 assistant DA's that were allocated to the district attorneys in the 16 budget for juvenile court as you know during the criminal justice reform uh, measures a good bit of the work has shifted and the way we handle juvenile court has shifted and the district attorneys took on a, a much bigger role in juvenile court and this was the first of the assistant DAs that have been provided to assist the DAs in doing those. You'll notice that we concentrated those assistant DAs primarily for two reasons but the biggest being the circuits that have the most counties. The covering juvenile court for those circuits are some of the more difficult because the juvenile courts are actually assigned to the county, but the circuit is function of the DA. So getting to juvenile court in five or six counties that's going on at the same time has been quite the challenge. So we concentrated on that for assistant DAs. As far as 2016 enhancements, we really have two. Um, working on my page five or the fifth page, it says 2016 enhancement. This first one was one of those uh, situations that we were handed the employee ERS share of the judicial retirement system increased from 6.98 to 12.19 percent. That spread pretty evenly over the elected district attorneys and the elected solicitor general. So that was a uh, cost added to the employer side. So that would be the um, 
first program. And then the second item is an enhancement related to six more established accountability courts. The district attorneys in and the circuits of Cordell, Houston, Middle, Paulden, Rome, and Toombs all had accountability courts up and running by January 1st of this year with approved courts that are functioning and have participants in it. Those circuits were not up and running during the session in 2015 when HB 279 was passed. At that time, we, we were allocated enough to cover 39 of the 49 circuits that were up and running. This is the six that have been up and running effective January the 1st. That leaves us with four circuits that don't have an accountability court. And I'll report to you that three of the four are actively working towards a functioning accountability court. So hopefully by this time next year, I'm, I'm here telling you that we've got all but one up and running. Um, I'll be glad to take any questions at this point, but that is that covers kind of what we've what we spent with what you give us and um, where we're at on our 2016 request. Thank you, Mr. Director. Um, let me ask a couple of questions. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right now, you're you're indicating in the in the amended budget that there are six newly established accountability courts. Yes, sir. Okay, and is there a, to your knowledge, is there a certification process by which um, a court or circuit is, has been chosen and, and then declared um, certified to be an accountability court? And if you would just explain that. Yes, sir, there is a process. Now, interestingly enough, that process is evolving because, as you know, there's been a, a newly created uh, accountability court council for this. But this was done during that transition period. These six additional courses, our counties now, have received some sort of funding to assist and have gone through that process and are meeting all the standards and qualifications that have been promulgated by the previous group that was regulating that and then the new group that will that will continue to regulate that. And there's a body that certifies that, is that correct? Yes, sir. What body is that? Well, it's, it's now going to be that new accountability court uh, uh, commission. Commission. Yes, sir. Um, one other question. That we've noticed that there is an um, increase in your, in the ERS, I'm sorry, it's in the the, ju the judicial retirement system, we've gone from 6.98% to 12.19%. That is an increase in the employer's contribution for the elected district attorneys and the elected solicitor general. So that only covers the single DA for each circuit and, and then also um, the solicitor for each of the court that, systems that have state court systems. That's correct. The, the employees within the district attorney's offices are generally a member of the ERS unless they're a county paid employee. And then the county uh, assistant solicitors are generally paid by the county with, with two exceptions. Are the, um, so the, throughout the state, every circuit has the, the assistant DAs and the assistant solicitors in every circuit where the solicitors exist. Those are paid for by the, their, their retirement benefits are paid for by the state or the counties? The state assistant district attorneys which there's one plus one for each judge plus two in each circuit, a state paid investigator, which there's one per circuit, and two administrative assistants per circuit are paid by the state, and they are members of the employee retirement system. If the district attorney's office receives any other help, then it's generally they are county employees or they are spacer employees, which is a creation of statute that allows the county to pay all expenses, both the employer and the employee benefit, but that they can participate in the ERS. You said there were two exceptions, though. Yes, sir. When we talk about assistant solicitor generals, those county, those courts are gen those offices are funded by the counties, and all employees within that county are paid by the county, including the solicitor general is actually paid by the county, with the exception of two counties, uh, Bibb County and DeKalb County have got some sort of uh, historical uh, grandfathering is the best way to describe it because it dates back to 1953 when it first started. The county paid employees in those two counties are actually allowed to be in the employer retirement system and we the state pays the employer contribution to that side. Okay. Another one of those things I inherited. And that includes this, that it was assistant DAs as well? It's, just, it's, it's, it's specific to the solicitor's offices in Bibb County and uh, DeKalb County. Okay. Thank you. Chairman Albers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Mr. Spejas, uh, in respect to the, the bib in DeKalb County, what's the <coughs> rough cost in that? Do you know off the top of your head? I don't know that off the top of my head. Do we know that off the top of my head? 80000 a year? Uh, approximately $80,000 a year. Okay. Why don't we uh, meet on that one offline? Yes, sir. Thank That'd you. Other questions from members? Um, Mr. Executive Director, the, the, the six that, um, I'm sorry, the 15 new ADAs that you have to help out with juvenile courts, um, is there a, in last year's budget, is there a commensurate amount of PDs that go along with that so that you're having a, basically an, evil, an even distribution? I don't believe they were actually allocated assistant DAs last year. I know Brian's here and, and, and will be following us. Um, I don't believe they were actually given that because there was a pretty big uh, additional piece. For, I know they've been trying to deal with uh, conflict cases, and I don't, I don't know how that corresponds to that. So the 15 that you got in 2016, though, that's the first set? That's the first set that, that we received, yes, sir, uh, and, and taking on those additional responsibilities. Okay. Other, other questions from members of the, the body? All right, seeing we have about five minutes left on this. Um, if you if you wanted to give a brief overview on, you know, just kind of a, a heads up, if you will, on 2017, we can do that. But I, from what from my look at 2017, there's substantial requests there that we may want to talk about in detail. But for those that are following in your big budget, <clears throat> that would be on page 75. If, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do, we do have a big, big ask in there. There's, there's a couple of things moving in the 17 budget. I would like an opportunity at a later point to, uh, to make a full presentation related to that. Um, but can we maybe spend our four minutes left focused on our most important ask, and it relates to compensation of assistant district attorneys and our working with the public defender system and, and ask for uh, a pay scale for public service attorneys. If I could give Mr. Porter sure. about a minute or two and then and Mr. Miller a, day, a minute or two. We'll just talk about that issue. Would that be okay? Yes, sir. That'd be fine. In the 2017 budget, the bu budget priority of the Prosecuting Attorneys Council is to attempt to stem the losses that we have suffered since the 2008 recession. Uh, we are now at a point where our turnover rate has significantly increased in each of the offices has to do simply with economics that people are leaving because they can no longer sustain their uh, student loan debt or their or their living expenses. Uh, we have not had any significant or or pay, uh, pay raises since 2008, and we believe that along with the public defenders that we have put forward a plan that helps us do that in terms of setting a pay scale that would set aside equality for the people who are actually in the trenches. Um, we're trying to do that over a three-year period to catch them back up to where they would have been. The most significant number I can give you is had the recession not happened, um, assistant DAs would be in a position where their, their compensation increases would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 37 percent. But the reality is they've seen a 5 percent increase since 2008 trying to remedy that and that is our budget priority I think mr. Miller has some very specific examples from his circuit that illustrate that point mr. chairman uh, right now the entry-level pay for an assistant DA uh, who either interned with our office before graduating or who was a, who attended a prosecution clinic uh, is forty three thousand nine hundred eighty four dollars that's that's to hire somebody right out of law school many of them with student debt over $100,000. Uh, my most recent hire, uh, his law school debt is $165,000. So we hire him in at $43,984. For somebody who started with the DA's office in 2007 or 2008 and has been with us, who started at entry level and has been with us the entire time with over eight years of prosecution experience, their salary right now is $46,662. So, so when somebody comes out of law school with just a clinic experience or interned with us this summer, uh, they're, they're making, uh, the, the one with over eight years experience, 
he's making about $51 a week more than somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing. It takes a while to, to train these folks and turn them loose. Because of that, we're losing people who wanted to come to us and be career prosecutors. Uh, from a historical perspective, Representative Caldwell remember this, uh, prior to 79 or 80, uh, it was the usual thing for, some, for an assistant DA to go to work for the district attorney, put in a couple of years, learn how to try cases, and then go out and make money. Uh, the legislature at that time decided hey, we need to have professional prosecution in this state to, to prosecute the crimes against our citizens. And so a pay scale was established. And when those folks like Danny and me came along in the early 80s, you could look at that pay scale and, and you might not make much money to start with, but you could see if you stick with it and hang in there, you could see where you could go and you had some certainty about it. Our people don't have that now. We have folks leaving us because they don't believe that there's a future in prosecuting. The last two out of three ADAs that have left me left with eight and a half years of experience. That means they walked away from the job a year and a half before vesting their retirement. Folks, this, this is a very serious situation for us in the prosecution community. That's why it's our budget priority and we do look forward to talking with y'all more about it in the future. Uh, Dan Miller, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, in light of the time, I want to round up. Are there any questions particularly? I'll take a couple of questions and we need to move on to the Department of Defense. Any questions? I think this is an important issue that really needs a little more time for us to ask questions and to, to bat this around um, amongst ourselves and then with y'all. Um, and I want to want to make sure it gets a fair hearing on that. Thank you. If there are no questions by the members, we'll excuse. I'm sorry. Chairman Alvarez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we get to uh, future meetings, it would be helpful to us because I believe we're all sympathetic by um, a very low salary for someone with that type of education uh, and position. Uh, as to where that lines up with other states helps us to make a more reasonable case, uh, as well as to be looking at pay scales not just based on longevity, but by performance. Uh, so if you could help us with those things, that would uh, uh, help move things along quicker. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chairman Coomer. Also, when we follow up, I heard, I heard, I know two, maybe all three of you mentioned student loan debt. Um, I understand there's a very robust student loan forgiveness program for, for public service attorneys. So if you're going to come and bring that as an argument, I'd like to hear the other side that, uh, so we'd be fully informed about what the real cost of practicing law as a district attorney or an ADA is in the state. Yeah, we'll, we, we'll do that. Some of that is uh, still a little speculative because the first payout has not been received by the feds yet, but we would definitely address it. I, I'm really referring to a program that's been in existence for a long time. I don't think it's a new program. It, it requires 10 years of vesting, and we haven't made the 10 years yet. So the federal government has not actually paid the money out on that program yet. Okay. All right, let's, let's hear more about that, but I think it's a good question. Um, we want to make sure we have a net. Yes. You know, and, and, and that as opposed to gross uh, yes. analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Brigadier General Joe Girard is our Adjutant General for National Guards, and we are honored to have him here today. Thank you for coming, Brigadier General. And if you would, just go ahead and start into your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, thanks for being here today. And the, uh, we're handing some slides out, uh, and the amended budget starts on page 92 of the budget document. And um, Mr. Kenley Finlinson is our state budget director, and he's going to hand some slides out that I'll start with. The second slide in that packet is the first one I'd like to discuss, and, and I'd like just to remind the committee that um, the state uh, budget is about $10 million, and against that state budget, we receive federally. Uh, a little over $480 million, so uh, a significant return on the investment uh, for your Department of Defense. On the second slide, it uh, breaks down that $10 million for the state, and as you can see, we uh, about 38% of that goes to our Youth Challenge Academy program. Uh, about 28% is split up, 18% to the Army Guard and 10% to the Air Guard for facilities maintenance and, and those type things. Uh, and the, the delta there is primarily uh, administrative. Uh, the, um, I'd like to point out that uh, out of our um, approximately 520 state employees, 
that only 16 of them are completely paid for with state funds. So as you can see, um, most of our budget is matched against that federal budget of almost $500 million uh, to include payroll for a lot of our state employees. And then getting to the amended budget on page 92, uh, there's about a $1,400, which is a statewide change I think you're familiar with. Um, our youth educational programs line is about 409000 I think most of you are aware that we're standing up a third YCA campus in Milledgeville at the state, old state hospital property. And uh, that 409 is to finish building out that property. We've already started that process, uh, but we need that additional funding to get the furniture and fixtures and so forth to make it suitable as we stand up that first class on 1 October of this year. So third YCA campus first class is October of this fall. Um, and then the, the middle t military readiness line is $1.1 $1 .1 um, we are, are um, think it's a great idea to move our armory in Albany onto the Marine Corps logistics base down there. There's several reasons for that move. Uh, first one being more secure location for our Albany unit. Uh, the second one is it gives our soldiers access to facilities on that military installation. And then the, the last one, it in, uh, which is pretty significant, is it increases the relevance of the Marine Corps logistics base in Albany. And, uh, and that plays a that base plays a vital role in the economy of Albany, and uh, and although there are no BRAC discussions ongoing at the present time at the federal level, that is always looming over our heads, and we're uh, as partners throughout the state and at all our installations, uh, we we try to do whatever we can to to help bolster uh, those facilities. So um, um, that's uh, all I've got for the amended budget. If there are any questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. We do have questions for you. Uh, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Morning, General. Morning. Always good to see you. Yes, sir. I, I'm a big proponent of Youth Challenge. It, it does an outstanding job. Now, I've been told that the Fort Stewart unit is ranked something like number four in the country. So we're very proud of it. I'm, I told a working group yesterday about the return on investment, it costs eighteen thousand dollars to incarcerate an adult in this state. My 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 suggestion is a, a question. The amended, I understand. When you come back with the seventeen, we've got some people working all over that have years in that are making less than ten dollars an hour, and these people primarily stay because of the mission. I certainly wish some, some consideration, and thank you so much for Milledgeville needed, but some consideration for them and some of the problems, uh, maintenance or, or buildings at Fort Gordon. They, they've reached a point of seriousness. Certainly wish some consideration could be given to such a good yes, program. Well, thank you very much, and, and I, for one, very much appreciate you your con, um, continuous uh, concern for the, the employees down there. One thing that I will speak to is that, uh, again, uh, they're state employees, and so it's matched by federal funds. And so um, when I sat here last year, I didn't have a good answer for you. Um, I've, I've got a better informed answer, but I'm not sure it's any better <laughs> overall. The, the uh, But it, it's not enough to ask the state for more money because i got to match it with federal funds. Um, one thing that we have done over the past year is we've asked for more of those federal funds, and so I think we we made a little uh, leeway with respect to gaining those so that we could match. Um, but it's not as easy as just asking this body for more money because I got to go find the other pot to match it with. But um, I agree with you; uh, those teachers truly care for those uh, cadets and those programs. It, it's remarkable um, to see the how much they care and. Uh, and so uh, we're continuing to look at that always. Tell the president I'm speaking with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, so we're, we're continuing to look at that, but thank you very much. Yes, uh, full leader Rogers. Gentlemen, here this morning. Um, I, this is something I say every year. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to brag a little bit about your state defense force. Um, 
I think it's like sixty-eight thousand dollars, something like that, in the budget for this group. Yes, sir. You, you want to brag on them and tell them what what that means as far as a return on investment with man hours? Well, I, the uh, I probably couldn't give you an accurate uh, figure. Uh, Kenley may have one off the top of his head, but it's it's in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, that they, they, you know, they're completely volunteers. They do unbelievable work. Uh, Gwinnett County. This is three or four weekends ago. Gwinnett County searched for a missing person. Um, all afternoon, couldn't find them into the night, called State Defense Force. They showed up at 7.30 on Saturday morning. Within two hours, had found the, the lost missing person, uh, which was an elderly lady who was, um, you know, wandering around and couldn't find her way home. And so, um, you know, and, and that's just one of numerous instances I could mention. But uh, they do great work, and, and uh, we're very proud of everything that they do, and, and, uh, and they do it as volunteers. It's truly amazing um, how much they care about the communities they serve. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Brigadier General, the, the line item that you have for uh, the Albany Readiness Center and the shift to the Albany Marine Base, that's a one-time expenditure, is that correct? Yes, sir, and it's matched by approximately uh, 400000 that the local community is going to match with that, but it is a one-time. Uh, once and the process for that is once it's established and we build it out and make the move, then uh, any of our facilities that are on federal installations are funded 100% federally. So if we make improvements to it, uh, then that is 100% federal um, dollars that is spent toward that. Um, so uh, so the pro we just got to get it there, and then we'll be good. Is that also true with your youth academies, the challenge academies? The uh, Milledgeville's different. Uh, the other two are on federal installations. Milledgeville's a state property, so it's going to be state funded there. Okay. All right. Thank you. And bullet no. Okay. Any other questions for the Brigadier General? <clears throat> sure. Okay. All right. Seeing no further questions, we thank you very much for the presentation. We'll probably talk to you a little bit more about uh, FY17. Uh, you may go ahead with 17. <clears throat> we don't have enough time to do it, so I wish we did, but we don't. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I, I, I will just make a mention. You'll get uh, Monday is uh, National Guard Day at the Capitol, and uh, all of you will get a, a copy of our annual report sometime between now and Monday. So thank you very much. Next one on our agenda is the Department of Law. And that's on 144 of your amended budget, 144. <clears throat> Attorney General Good Owens, morning. thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, would you just introduce the ladies to oh, your right and left? To my honor, sir. To my uh, right is Ann Bentley, who heads our operations. And to my left is Sarah Warren, who's our Deputy Solicitor General. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I would mention that per an earlier email we received, uh, we were told to be prepared for FY17, and I am. And candidly, we requested no changes for FY16, so I'm certainly open to any questions you want to ask me on FY16, but I'm hopeful that means we can get right to FY17. Let me ask the committee, do you, does the committee have any particular questions? We're on page 144 of your amended. If there are... If there are no questions, then I'm happy for you to go ahead and look at um, 17. I didn't see note any changes other than the changes that <clears throat> that are statewide, um, and there were some transfers, internal transfers. So I didn't note any major differences there. That was just consumer affairs coming in house. It's it's a zero dollar difference. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Then we'll let, let's let the AG go into his 17 budget. Let me turn let me get you on that page too. Thank you. I believe it's 279. 279 of the big budget. For, for years, I've been coming before uh, this committee as well as other committees, and I've been watching my colleagues, such as the GBI uh, and the great director, come with necessary needs that were more important, candidly, than me having lawyers, uh, agents, crime lab openings, etc. And I was a team player. Uh, and many of you asked me the question, how am I making it work? And the answer was, I'm really not. We were losing about 15% a year of our lawyers. The two charts that we're sending you uh, show candidly that uh, 
Uh, about 80% of our departures are lawyers 15 years or less, uh, so that we have less and less experience in the office to handle the, the big cases that we're asked to, to, to handle. Uh, this past fall, I went up to the governor, uh, and I went up to many of the uh, folks in leadership, and I said, this is the year I could greatly use your help uh, because as the economy's improved, funding has uh, been given additional funding to some of my colleagues in the public safety area. We really need your help. And the governor came through and made a fantastic recommendation to our office. So the short answer was please keep all the money the governor put in our budget. If you promise me you'll do that, I can leave now. <laughs> short of that, I'll be happy to go through, through detail because the, you know, the governor's uh, proposal uh, was pretty much by penny what we requested, and we greatly appreciate it. It really composes a, a couple categories. One uh, was an increase in starting salary. We had gone from 52 to 50, back to 52. Uh, many state agencies were starting at 60. The agency uh, that we incorporated last July started at 60, the Consumer Protection Unit. And candidly, it's uh, very poor for morale when state agencies are often paying their lawyers more than my lawyers are being paid, and we're the only lawyers that can go in the courtroom. Uh, the governor fully agreed to give the eight, to propose the $8,000 increase to 60000 And then there are commensurate increases up until the 15-year level, once again, to keep these lawyers in the, in the office. Now, some of you may say, uh, but Attorney General, it's common for your lawyers to then go to private practice. Candidly, that's not my problem. My problem is they're being poached by my clients. And that's a real problem because it's great that I'm the training ground, but I need lawyers in-house at that point. So the governor put in the money in, in his proposed FY17 budget for the 52 to 60 uh, for commensurate increases thereafter, really regard to retention. We're not talking here COLA, we're talking 100% retention. And then he put in, at our request, an additional amount of money uh, for our stars, our future stars, to where they could potentially get increases of up to $10,000, because these are the folks, candidly, that the agencies are taking from me. So in the past six months, uh, for instance, the Department of Driver Services, bless their little heart, but both of their lawyers were in my office. Mm -hmm. If you look at GDOT, for instance, four of their lawyers used to be in my office, and, and BHDD just took one of my lawyers. It's great that they're taking them, but I need some warm bodies with experience in the office. The governor fully agreed with that. And then in concert with Ryan Teague, the executive counsel, he requested that we uh, come forward with a fellowship program, three lawyers year one, three lawyers year two. This would be where we would seek to take the best and brightest from the Georgia schools, the, the Georgia kids. We would pay them the same minimum salary our other lawyers get, the 60000 if this is approved by the legislature, but I'd be able to hire them before they pass the bar, and I'd be able to ask them where they want to be in the office since they're new positions. So as you can imagine, right now I tell these bright guys and gals, talk to me after you pass the bar in October. Well, by then they have offers, right? And then where my, uh, most of my initial openings, workers' comp and habeas. I'm not getting the bright guys and gals that you would like me to have in the office. This literally lets me take three really sharp Georgia brand new lawyers, bring them to our office for a two-year fellowship with the hope that they stay, the hope that as there's normal uh, attrition, they move into other parts of our office. And, and frankly, that is just as valuable as the other areas and having the best and brightest in our law firm. Uh, we have a lot of very difficult litigation uh, and I really need the best and brightest that we can bring to our office. And many of you have been very willing to help me. It's just been a function of when the state budget uh, would permit that, that opportunity. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, and I'm happy to take any and all of your questions, if they're hard, they go to Ann or Sarah, <laughs> is um, the merit increase that is proposed. Uh, it's very important that we retain that merit increase. Please do not seek to remove it because the governor gave us the other monies. The proposal that I mentioned to you is uh, practically all for the lawyers zero to 15. Some section heads, but pretty much all zero to 15. I have more employees, as you would imagine, that are not lawyers. What the governor gave and what we requested isn't an additional dime for my paralegals, for my nurses, for my investigators, for my assistants. 
So the 3% that the governor has otherwise put in the budget is really essential because I'm losing them too. They're being poached also. I remember talking to Chairman Jack Hill on the Senate side and there's only one, I think, budget person there that was there a year ago. And, you know, the same thing in the House. So, so I'm being poached also, and it's really hoped that that 3% will go a long way in helping me keep those employees in our office because, let's face it, uh, uh, paralegals, nurses, investigators, assistants, that, that, that they, they make the world go round. They help us go to trial. They help us do our work. And at this point, I'd, I'd be honored to take any and all of your questions. But the long and short of it is, please just keep what the governor recommended. Thank you, Attorney General. Um, Chairman Albers. Thank you, Chairman. Attorney General, always great to see you. Um, and I certainly support what you're trying to do. And, and I know we've had these discussions for many years now. Uh, it may be helpful uh, in future hearings just to provide, because I know I know the answer to this, but I think for everyone to show that what that turnover really means as far as fiscal impact to begin with. Obviously, there are operational issues that affect your organization and your department. Uh, however, there's a big cost when you have to lose someone and rehire them and go through that process. And again, I support this fully, and I know it's the right thing to do. It'll just help us to, to make sure it stays where it belongs. Well, thank you. And, and for instance, I lost two lawyers the past year to the Board of Regents. As a result of that, for the first time in several years, we actually retained an outside lawyer uh, because I needed that expertise in employment law that I heretofore did not need. That was all done in-house. So once again, as you're losing lawyers and you're hiring new lawyers at the pay scale, uh, that means that if it's a very difficult case, I may not have the lawyer in-house I used to have. So that's actually an additional cost to the state at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Representative, Representative Williams. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Greatest county in the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question or that statement about the hidden costs in my other life that afforded me to come here and now I've spent all of that. We did a company and the company's cost, that hidden cost was the reason they were losing money, the cost of turnover. It's very expensive, not often talked about, but I looked at your Medicaid fraud control unit. <clears throat> Excuse me, can you help me with kind of a return, for lack of a better word, return on investment. I know you investigators that you, you're trying to get some help for, help you move in there. What, what kind of monies were, were brought in or saved the state through that unit last? So let, let me give you one very recent example, mm -hmm. uh, Representative Williams. Uh, there was a multi-state um, effort with regard to a lab and there was an announced amount of money, uh, don't quote me, but I think about $250 million that would be split between the federal government and states. Uh, and historically, what would have happened is that would have been the end of it for Georgia. We would have rested on the laurels of other states and the Justice Department. But in this case, with what the governor and you gave me about two years ago to enhance our unit with a specific civil section in addition to the criminal section, we along with Florida and one other state that I candidly don't remember just announced last week a settlement that was separate from the multi-state that brings our state an additional six and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. Prior to having that enhancement in our unit, that would have never happened, would have never come to us through the multi-state. I can't express my uh, pleasure with how that Medicaid fraud unit has grown and uh, improved over my term as Attorney General. Uh, we actually are holding the national meeting later this year in Atlanta, and that is representative of what that unit is doing. We are by far bringing in more money than it's costing the state to house that unit. Also keep in mind that that's a 2575 share. So the state of Georgia pays for 25% of my Medicaid fraud unit with the federal government kicking in 75%. And it, it is huge, the amount of money they are bringing back to the state, way over the amount of money the state is uh, bringing my unit. And very, very pleased with them. Uh, we are doing uh, investigations and indictments that never before occurred in that unit as a result of the trust that the governor and legislature 
have given us to bring in some really sharp prosecutors and really sharp lawyers in that civil section. And the <coughs> six and a half millions this year, we already brought in you know millions of dollars from July of last year mm -hmm. to now. I mean, it, it's not a close call whether that is a big benefit to the Department of Community Health. Thank you. Uh, is it Chairman Coomer? Putting on? No, uh, Chairman Williams. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the work you're doing over there. I'm, I was curious in Medicaid fraud if you might, in your investigations, if you can figure out anything we can do legislatively to prevent them from co uh, committing the fraud. One of the things we did uh, a few years ago is introduced a bill that allowed for fingerprinting so that w when they presented their Medicaid card to the provider, uh, that was not past uh, but if if there's if there's something we can do to tighten up their ability to commit fraud while you're doing these investigations we, we'd like to know what that could be so we could help tighten up the law the, my question would be though regarding your you didn't mention why you lost the lawyers to other agencies but I'm assuming it's salaries it, 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 uh, I'm losing them uh, on average a minimum of fifteen thousand and often thirty thousand dollar pay differences to my clients. It, it's not a function that they want to leave. They come in the office a lot of times teary eyed. But you know, if you have a young family, once again, we're talking about my lawyers one to fifteen years, and you have a, a young family, you can't really tell your spouse you love the job so much you don't want the extra twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Right. Um. <laughs> Uh, Mr. General, we got about. If four. I could just mention one thing, I'm sorry, uh, Chairman. Uh, we've been working with uh, Commissioner Reese. Uh, there is some really good software out there that both DCH and the Medicaid Fraud Unit can be using to further find fraudulent activity. And Van Perlberg, the head of our unit, has been working with mm. Commissioner Reese. It is hoped that DCH will acquire that software and that we will have access to that software because with it we'll have that much more data to potentially find that fraudulent activity and to save the state far more money than the cost of the software. <coughs> you made a comment rather than a question, but I did want to tell you we were working with DCH and, and I believe that would bear fruit. We're, we're running out of time, so I need to make sure I get I've got I got four people that'd like to ask you questions. Sorry. Yes. <coughs> uh, Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for being here. I just wanted to make sure I was clear. I think I am, but I just want to make sure no one leaves here under the wrong impression. The Medicare fraud unit, the Medicaid fraud unit, you're talking about going after providers for things like overbilling or gaming the system. We're not talking about the patients. True. True. Thank you. True. And, and, and it's frankly rife. Uh -huh. It is. Uh -huh. All right. That's where it is. Thank you, Representative. Uh, is it Ms. C, C, is it right? No? Uh, sorry, Vice Chairman. Oh, Mandy, is that you? 22. I've got, 20, I got 27 open, is it? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Representative Caldwell, <laughs> go ahead. Yes, sir. Mr. AG, I want to make sure that I understood. You said your entry level is 52,000. Yes, sir. And entry level, I, I guess you heard a moment ago for assistant DAs, is 43,000. Yes, sir. And yet you are asking for uh, an increase for entry level for your individuals? Yes, sir. Uh, do you know how we could justify uh, the assistant DA has somebody, may have somebody's life in their hands? And I understand your people are important, don't misunderstand me. But basically you're trying to civil litigation. And I'm just trying to see how I can balance the two, okay. if you have, could have an answer for me. Well, if, if we talk about costs for a second, as Representative Williams was covering before, uh, we're involved in civil litigation with plenty of zeros. So, for instance, when there's a lawsuit concerning the pension, where a loss would cost the state nine to ten numbers, nine to ten zeros, and we won that case, those are often the kind of cases we're defending on the civil side. The, we're talking a lot of zeros that I need really, really bright lawyers so that the state treasury doesn't pay for it. Additionally, keep in mind, we handle all the habeas. We handle all the death penalty work. So when there's a murder appeal 
my lawyers are in that courtroom. My lawyers are handling uh, much of the appellate. Now, in the large jurisdictions, say the top five jurisdictions in the state, it is true that the DA's office is very, very active in those cases. But elsewhere, it's frankly my lawyers in those criminal cases. So while we're not the trial level, we are the appellate level. Uh, so for instance, last year, there were five executions in the state. Uh, where there are many murder cases, we're about 60% of the Georgia Supreme Court's caseload. So I'd, I'd frankly base it on the type of case that we're being asked to either bring or defend on the civil side, as well as the, uh, the criminal. Keep in mind also, my lawyers are generally in Metro Atlanta, where the cost of living is far higher than in some other areas. And in other areas, there are supplements by county similar to the judicial system. Uh, and of course, my lawyers don't have supplements. It's the state at that point. So if you're asking me, do I think that the DAs have, have similar problems? Absolutely, sir. Do they do the best they can? Absolutely. I certainly don't want to be viewed today as anything other supportive of the DA's initiative. But, but candidly, we're statewide and we're going all over the state in this, with the litigation. And more and more, this litigation's got a whole bunch of zeros attached to it with regard to potential liability. And I can't have a young lawyer in those cases or an, ex an experienced lawyer in those cases. All right, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. One more question. Um, Alex Atwood, Representative Atwood. I wave, Mr. Chairman. My question's been answered. Good all right, thank you. Uh, we're trying to stay on schedule here. We appreciate you. your time. Um, certainly, if we need to follow up with you, we may call you back and ask Absolutely. for it when we hit the 17 budget. This is a pretty important issue. Thank you all very much thank for you. your help. General, I understand you're at Matthew May's restaurant this week. You bought I, I, Senator Williams nor I any, any biscuits or anything. I, mean, I was at your rotary yesterday. That's what I understand. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is the Department of Public Safety. Colonel Mark McDonough, Commissioner. And I believe we have Jason Johnson, CFO. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, Jason's the bald guy. Uh, the lady that's in the yellow <laughs> is our comptroller, Miss uh, Amy Stansel. Our amended 16 request is uh, very brief. Um, the only thing that is there uh, are the statewide adjustments for the That's, department. Let me, let me interrupt. That's on page 164 of your amended governor's budget. Thank you. Uh, and then a uh, line item change for the language for our field services. It's not additional funds. Uh, it's just the important uh, yes that we ask for each year. Uh, to be able to use any funds that are there due to attrition uh, to fund uh, future trooper schools. And uh, it's very important to us right now. Our manpower is down drastically. Um, in uh, FY15, we lost 52 troopers. And thus far, year to date in FY16, we've lost 64 troopers for a total of 116 folks that have left us. And when you're graduating trooper schools that are only putting out 30, uh, you can see that you get behind the power curve uh, very quick. So your support in, uh, um, in that yes language for us to be able to expend those funds for a trooper school, which starts uh, April the 3rd, uh, would be appreciated. And with that, that is the sum total of our amended. All right, let's take questions on the amended budget. Uh, Chairman Albers. Colonel, thank you for all your wonderful work. Did, did you say that we've already lost in fiscal 16, 64 troopers? Yes, sir. Wow. I mean, I, why the precipitous increase? Well, we've got uh, the clash of essentially three things. We live in interesting times, and folks are leaving law enforcement. Uh, and the pool of applicants uh, is shrinking that we're all competing for. And so the competitiveness for those applicants um, we're not as competitive as we used to be um, because of our pay and uh, things that we offer versus what other folks offer. Uh, we have issues there. And then because of that, the quality of candidates that we also have, uh, we are losing folks because of discipline issues. So you combine those that are getting out of law enforcement, the issue of not being competitive where we should be with our benefits, and then our discipline issues, um, that's pretty much where it lies. 
Well, certainly I know we can help you with part, but not all of that. But uh, know this, we appreciate you and every single person that puts on a uniform, and you are all heroes for doing such. Thank you, sir. Chairman Powell. Thank you, Colonel. How many, uh, how many troopers are y'all authorized for? Uh, you, you, that number has always been out there as uh, 953. Uh, before the Department of uh, Motor Vehicle Safety uh, left us, it was 989. Uh, but essentially, that number doesn't mean anything anymore. It's essentially what you're funded for, what your budget can My support. next question is, how many are y'all funded for? Uh, as of March of last year, we had 852 troopers. That were funded? Yes, sir. And how many do you have today? We're below 770. We haven't been that low in a decade. Thank you. Um, Floor Leader Rogers. Thank you, Colonel. Good morning. Good morning um, I just want to follow up, just maybe as an observation. You said that you were given the reasons for people leaving. Uh, what, where does this bode for uh, you guys looking in the future, trying to recruit new people? What are y'all? What are y'all seeing there? Well, we're seeing that pool shrinking. Uh, we've seen, uh, for instance, we, we measure it uh, where folks actually show up that are serious, actually take our physical fitness test. And uh, where before, you know, we'd have 30 or 40 show up, uh, now we're having 14 or 15 show up. Uh, there was a time where each school had close to 3,000 applicants, uh, and now that, that applicant pool is shrinking down uh, into the four or five hundreds. And then by the time we get to the choosing point, uh, after they go through our background, we're lucky to have 60 or 70 folks to choose from to actually put in school. And then once that occurs, we have an attrition rate between 40 and 50 percent in school. Is there, is there anything that the department is doing from a proactive standpoint to try to recruit good people? I mean, I mean obviously you're trying to get, recruit good people. Is there a marketing campaign? Are you going out into the school system? Sir? Yes, sir. We have a full-time recruiting staff. Uh, we use social media, and uh, we have also plugged into the technical colleges. Uh, we recruit statewide, and we try to use every avenue to get qualified people. Very good. Thank you. I want to follow up on Senator Albers and tell you how much we appreciate the job you guys do. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Atwood. Colonel, thank you. Thank you for what you do very much. Very heartfelt. I mean that. I've known troopers since I was a very young man and I've never had anything but the greatest admiration for, for all the men and women. You have high standards Thanks, and sir. I appreciate it. Uh, to drill down a little bit on the previous question, have you reached out to the military, people getting off active duty, that sort of thing? Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, you, you would think that that would be a pool that we would have a lot of folks to draw from, and we do. We hire a lot of veterans, uh, but we learned a couple of things in that effort where we have a group of people that have essentially been involved in conflict, and there's not so many that want to go into another job of conflict. And they've actually told us that so. You know, we've actually pulled them out of the crowd and said, why aren't you interested in law enforcement? And when you've had three and four tours overseas, and you've been in continual conflict, they don't look to this as a job that they traditionally used to at coming out of the service. We need to go visit the Marines a little bit. We'll get them, we'll get them in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it, 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 war it warmed my heart when I heard the Department of Defense was moving on to Albany that the Marine Corps will provide them the safe and secure place that they need. Uh, that really warmed it my was, heart. It was very, very difficult yes, for sir, me not was, to say that. <laughs> I don't see Joe here anymore. Um, it's a full-fledged retreat. Uh, the, Colonel, the, one other question. The, um, on, on the 50-man trooper school, could you just explain a little bit about uh, the number 50? Is, it, is, it, is there a reason behind the number? Um, and you said you, you're looking at a class of 30-something coming in. So uh, we, do we have attrition in, in the trooper school that we lose individuals? Could you just explain that a little bit? Um, 50 is traditionally what uh, is a good number uh, for us to be able to hiring within the training environment. And so when we want that number, we load as many people in as we can, knowing that there's going to be attrition associated with that. I'd like to put 100 people in there knowing that at the end there's going to be 50, uh, but uh, I'll just use this last class. Uh, we only have 75 qualified folks that we were able to offer a job to, and we're going to put every one of them in there knowing that we're going to lose 40 to 50 percent. But 50 uh, is a manageable number. It's a manageable number uh, at the training center. Uh, I smile when I say this, but there's 
there's a thought process that when you get to firing four weeks into it, there's 26 lines on the firing range, and you can run two relays, and that's 52 folks. So there's some measuring sticks uh, as far as the facility and what we can do, and that seems to be a good manageable number. If we have that and we run two schools a year, uh, then we're able to stay on top of uh, a tradition, you know, any attrition and hopefully grow. But uh, we just haven't seen that in the past couple of years. Thank you, Colonel. Um, Representative Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Colonel, always good to see you. You were doing so good until the Marine comments. <laughs> but I um, just wanted to say that, that um, very seriously, we appreciate what you've done, but I needed to say this. I haven't had the opportunity. I haven't taken the opportunity, but un unlike Representative Atwood, you, I can't say that all of my experiences through life have been positive with the Georgia State Patrol. But, I, I, but they've I, corrected I, your behavior, I, though, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and, and not in recent years am I referring to. So we need to try I, harder with you. You need to work harder. Yeah, okay. But in all, in, in, in all honesty, you know, because of folk like Representative Hitchens and yourself and maybe a couple other directors, you changed the culture of the State Patrol. State Patrol was, was, when I was growing up, was very terroristic. And, and, and I appreciate what you all have done with the quality of troopers you've hired. And, and because I remember when the first African American became a trooper, same with the GBI under Director Keaton, the culture has changed. That's good for everybody. Yes, sir. And I, in Savannah, where we've had some crime trouble, to, to, you know, at the very least. But they, they talked about and did some significant pay increases, talked about Chief Lumpkin, et cetera. So they saw a good jump in the class that's coming in for new police folk. The culture continues to change. And as it changes, and as some of those issues that you've raised changes, I think that you'll see an upswing eventually because when you live out our way, I see only a couple of commercials that are specific. But as far as the marketing effort down in the rule, it's not really as apparent as I'd like to see. And I know you would, too, with the right funding. But marketing would help. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Floor Leader Rogers. No, is that Vice Chair Hightower? OK. Is that, uh, sorry, just call one. Thank you. Colonel, I want to ask you concerning your uh, supplemental budget. You requested uh, $401,950 for schools, uh, which says for the Peace Officer Standards and Training Council. Why is that not in your big budget, and why are we not taking it up in the supplemental? Um, are you talking about the uh, the post council sir yes okay uh post council is an attached agency to us uh it's not something that i can answer in their budget you'll have to ask that uh, of the director of post council all right i was just concerned as why it wasn't in the big budget and it's being added to the supplemental budget okay thank you well, Judge. He'll, he'll talk to me. all right with that we're on schedule so uh if there are any further questions for colonel mcdonald we'll take those up we're going to Colonel, we're going to ask you to come back for the yes, 17. Um, we had a lot of, uh, obviously, support for what you're doing um, in the FY16. But, um, and you, you clearly have a lot of fans here. Um, folks appreciate the work that your men and women do across the state. We appreciate your service, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next on our agenda is um, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, GBI, Director Keenan. And uh, I think Fiscal Officer Buck is here for us, and I, I see he has, a, has many more members of our distinguished GBI here with him today. And Director Keenan, if you'll just, I'm going to get a page number for everybody to, to track you um, in your presentation, but it takes me a minute to go to my tabs. Yes, sir. It's uh, the amended budget for GBI is on uh, page 135, but uh, that's a very simple uh, across the board. Uh, Teamworks increase of funds is required by the IRS for their new reporting requirements. So, sir, with your permission, I'd like to go to the page 258. 
which is the twenty seventeen budget for the g b i and we have two areas in there that before we do that i'm sorry director i want to make sure that the count the committee has an opportunity to look at their fiscal budget if there was any in the amended budget sixteen are there any questions about that right now there are no changes in it other than the statewide changes that we're seeing across the board all right see seeing no questions then we'll go ahead thank you yes sir thank you and this will be on page two five nine uh, I had prepared uh, when we were doing the governor's budget I prepared two white papers pointing out critical areas of need in the GBI one of which was the need to have additional toxicology scientists uh, in the crime laboratory and the governor had put in his budget uh, one point one million seventeen thousand two oh five and that is to hire five toxicology scientists and also to have their supplies plus additional funding uh, for DNA biology supplies. And uh, the toxicologists are critical to the death investigation process. In fact, we did a study in the crime laboratory and determined that the primary factor in the delay in completing autopsy report was waiting, reports was waiting on toxicology to be completed. We've seen a 5% increase in the demands on toxicology in the last past year. Since 2010, we've had an increase of 28,000, uh, a 28 percent uh, increase in the demands on toxicology. So I would request your support for the governor's budget to uh, hire toxicologists uh, and give the related supplies. The second item in the governor's budget was is under regional investigative services, and I had also prepared a white paper for the governor's consideration pointing out the demands that now are upon the GBI to conduct officer use of force cases where there is death or serious injury. And we, uh, we had uh, currently there's been such a demand on us for these type of investigations. I've been having to pull agents off of child sex trafficking, public corruption, drug enforcement, and put them working the officer use of force cases. It, it has become a national standard to have outside agencies do the officer use of force cases, and so there's been a continual demand on, on us. We worked five cases in the last six days, two of them yesterday. One was a fatality, a shootout down in Lowndes County, and the other was a Clayton County shooting. This is, this is routine for us. Over the weekend, we had three cases. There are a tremendous amount of resources that have to go into an officer use of force case. They are, they, it requires multiple agents, it requires a, a multiple crime scene units, and it's a very detailed amount of work. Yesterday, the Atlanta Police Department, uh, Chief George Turner, held a news conference and announced to the city of Atlanta that the GBI would now be investigating all of their use of force cases, additional work, of course. There is no alternative. There, we, are the, we are the state level law enforcement agency, so now we're waste, basically working all of the use of force cases in, in the state of Georgia. So I would request your support for the governor's recommendation of $3.7 million to hire the 20 agents and their operational cost. Our if, we, if, these, if this is funded, what, we intended, what I intend to do is to have six agents based here in Atlanta to handle the workload in the metropolitan Atlanta, and then the other agents would, be, would go out to our field offices to handle the workload out there. So with that, I'll answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Director. Chairman Albers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, always good to see you, and thank you for all the work uh, that you and uh, your agents do. Uh, I know that uh, it's been difficult um, with attrition over the last many years, and, and one of my concerns was, even after we passed the, the incremental pay raise, is your folks are still starting sometimes lower than a patrolman is and in, in some of our cities, just in Metro Atlanta, around the state. and in my perception, you know, the top law enforcement, obviously, in our state is the GBI. Uh, and I'd like to understand a little bit more about what we're doing as far as comparing ourselves to other states. This can be for a future meeting. Uh, and also looking at other potential levers we can do, such as, you know, for most federal counterparts for you all, they are um, uh, incenting them uh, for their on-call time. 
where they could not necessarily be doing other things. And if someone's going to be on call and, and already accepting a position that's much lower and sometimes half of what a federal position is, perhaps we can be creative in order to help those young families. I don't think it's much different than what the Attorney General mentioned just a few minutes ago. Um, you know, we understand why they might have to move on and leave, but I would want them to, to aspire to come to you as opposed to leave because they need to support their families. Yes, sir, and I look forward to having discussions with you on this. Currently, what we're, we're, we're hiring people out of college because <coughs> veteran officers would have to take a pay cut to come work for us unless if they're in, based in Metro Atlanta or the larger agencies. So we look forward to having, uh, having that discussion. Um, we're, with the requirements to be a GBI agent are the same to be an FBI agent. But you're right. We do. We work harder and we make less money. And one last point, if I could. <laughs> you won't get any disagreement on this uh, committee, I believe. Uh, if you could, uh, at a future time, also perhaps give us the total number of GBI agents uh, that you've had over the last maybe 10 or 20 years. Uh, my concern is our population is increasing, just like our state police, but our number of uh, law enforcement uh, is decreasing. So if you could bring us those numbers at a future yes, meeting, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Senator Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, how are you this morning? Doing well, sir. Thank you for being here. Look forward to talking later as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned it, the city of Atlanta asked you all to do more work, and therefore we're, we're accompanying that uh, or taking a taking that into consideration with the new budget. Are there anything in the history, and maybe somebody knows on the, on the committee that's been in government longer than me, where the cities would do an intergovernmental transfer and, and, and shift monies to you since they've asked you to do more work instead of the state taking on the financial burden? Well, <laughs> there has been discussions over that over the years, um, particularly in the area of the crime lab, of charging for crime lab services. Uh, our position has always been it's taxpayer money and it's best appropriated at the state level and we're not holding to the local agencies. Quite frankly, I believe if they had to reimburse the GBI for either investigative services or crime lab, the work would just go undone. All right. And um, Chairman Powell. Thank you. Good morning, Vernon. Morning, sir. Uh, currently, how many agents are y'all authorized for just investigative agents? 260. And what do you have currently funded? We, got, we have seven vacancies. How many is funded? Oh, just funded. Uh, 253. You know, I got a question, and I really don't know how to pose it because I almost seem gallus when I ask this about these new roles as far as investigation on uh, on officer shootings and all, but seems like this seems to be the direction that we're going, and y'all are the perfect uh, agency to do the investigation. But the thing that I'm concerned about is that I can understand y'all getting involved in investigations of a of a nature that it might be suspicious in a shooting. Mm -hmm. But what about the obvious shootings? Well, in the role of law enforcement as a as a as any law enforcement officer, they're going to encounter at time to time the most obvious of a shooting. Yes, sir. What we find, though, is that the officer's best defense is a thorough fact-finding. It's also what the community demands, that uh, many times we're able to look at an incident and say, yes, this is, go this is not going to be a problem shooting, particularly when there's been a gun battle between the police and, you know, con felons. But that, that isn't always the case. And even, even on those cases, the, the public expects to have a thorough fact-finding so that there's not any conspiracy theory out there that there has been a cover-up or that there is going to be a lack of transparency. It's been our experience because we do so many of these that we, do, we just have a very structured process that we follow no matter what the circumstances are and then the outcome will be the truthful fact finding. Do you foresee that uh, now that the city of Atlanta has held their press conference and basically they're going to lay it all off on the on GBI? What about our other agencies around the state, the local PD, sheriff's departments? Do you foresee that every one of those will now step forward and say, "We want y'all to do the, the yes, background"? Sir. 
with, 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 with the Atlanta Police Department asking us to take over their cases, we have the cut, we're already doing the rest of the state, have been, have been doing this for the last two decades based upon an agency having either number, not having the resources to do the investigation in the case of a small agency, or the larger agencies having had a controversial use of force and being criticized for doing their own work, they've come to us. For instance, Savannah, Chatham County, we started doing their work seven years ago. We did Augusta, Richmond County a decade ago when they had a problem, problem controversial shooting and the sheriff said, I'll never go through this again. I'll call the GBI and take this, uh, the problem of us investigating ourselves, take that issue off the table and have the state come in and do it. Just, uh, just your particular taking a, just taking a wag at this. How many cases do you think that we might wind up being involved in on an annual basis for investigation? We average two a week. Last, last year we worked 91 cases. That's, those are those, and those are just cases where there is death or serious injury. An yeah. officer uses force, death or uses serious injury. And out of that hundred or so cases that you were anticipating at the starting point, which we probably could possibly go up, how many of those would you say merit an investigation? It isn't just an obvious investigation of the bad guy, and there was a shooting. Well, every one has to. Everyone has to be investigated. But the outcome is such that when, it, when it's all over with, the use of force is very clear cut and that the officers were justified, they were involved in a gun battle. That gets lost in the, in the media accounts about what has happened. That's why it's so important, and Georgia's fortunate because we've got a database of what has happened. And I can go, I can look over the last three years and see all the instances about what has happened in the use of force, and it's very clear cut. The officers are, are the, the officers are in danger, and they're responding. Uh, the level, the number of cases we're working, speaks to the level of violence that's directed against Georgia law enforcement. And it's not, it's not just our states across across the country. My counterparts in other states are experiencing the same thing. They've had dramatic increases in their calls for conducting these type of investigations, and it speaks to the level of violence that uh, we are encountering across the United States. Thank you. Senator Chairman Williams. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Keenan. Yes, sir. Um, you, you've been around a long time in several different uh, roles, and I, I just want to say we appreciate your, your uh, dedication, your work to the agencies that you've worked for. My, and you've been around several years when we actually were cutting budgets. Yes, sir. And, um, I've never known you to ask for anything you didn't need. In fact, most of the time I think you don't ask for enough. Um, in talking with some of your agents out there, uh, they're saying we need more people. Yes, sir. And you're, you're not requesting but 20 more people, it seems like, and they're in an area where we're really not investigating crime, we're investigating officers, yes, sir. which may need to be investigated. But my my wife asked me this a, a few days ago to buy her a gun and now when my wife asked to, to buy a gun she's she's feeling endangered we've had a number of violent crimes in my county i've had lots of break-ins at my uh, business <clears throat> and my my question is do you need more people funded and if so, how many do you really need? Because there are a lot of folks now that are concerned about terror. They, uh, um, they're afraid to go out. I mean, it's... Yes, sir. Let, let me answer this this way. The, the, the 20 agents is critical for us now. What I, we can always use additional agents. Last year, the General Assembly funded us eight agents to work elder abuse and crimes against the disabled. Those are the first new positions we've had in a decade. So everything we get is important, but I've got other priorities in the agency. For instance, the crime laboratory. And we'll be coming, coming back next year pointing out how we critically need additional 
scientist in the crime laboratory because that's the sole source provider of forensic services for the, for the state. So I'm balancing out. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, out I'm not interested in, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you're being frugal. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. I'm more interested in our very primary obligation at government of protecting people. Yes, sir. And I was, my curiosity is what it is you, if you, if you had, if you made out your Christmas list, what would it be? I mean, w w do we need 50 more people, 100 more people? I would ask for I would ask for 40 agents, double what, what, what we have for officer use of force. We're bu we're we're extremely busy. The, uh, you turn on the news, lead stories, GBI because we're working working the cases. What there's a failure to understand at the public level is the media constantly talks about the crime crime rate decreasing and the overall crime rate is decreasing but what is happening is crime is more complex now than it's ever been and it's more violent so there will be continue to be demands on the GBI and uh, I appreciate the support that the General Assembly has given us you, you, prov you provided uh, pay increase for our medical examiners last year and we've got two new doctors coming on July 1 to be the first time we've been fully staffed in our medical examiner office in many years so uh, if I could just follow up yes, sir. Um, I, <laughs> I would suggest that if you really need 40 you ask for 80 and maybe <laughs> all right well we'll, we'll do the we'll do the horse trading later um, <laughs> um, Let's move on. We got we got a lot of questions, so I need to. And we're we're, at, we're almost out of time here. Let me be very quick with your questions, and uh, director, if you could try to be very succinct yes, in those responses. Uh, Floor leader Rogers, uh, director, I think you just answered my first question. The uh, medical uh, examiners that we funded for you guys last year, we're up to speed on that now. Will be July one. Great, thank you. Second question, just sort of a follow up to what uh, Colonel McDonald said. He said he was having a hard time getting good people. Uh, and you're sitting here trying to find 20 new investigators and do this and do that. Is that a problem that you foresee for your department also? It will continue to be, a, it will always be a continue, be a problem for law enforcement. We gave the special agent exam last week and had 160 people took the exam. Normally we will have 550 to, you know, 600 take mm -hmm. the test. But we still get quality people because we can hire, we can hire young men and women straight out of college and, We'll fill out. We'll fill our rank. And as a, and as a follow up to that, are are you guys? Do you have in place something like what they do to try to recruit these good people? Do you have a recruiting organization? Yes, sir. We, okay. We're constantly on the lookout. Thank you, sir. Vice Chairman Hightower. Thank you for being here this morning. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions um, on the increased funds for the five toxicologists and the twenty investigators. Can you break down that pay a little bit? What you're asking for? Yes, sir. The, um, the for the for the for the twenty GBI agents, the uh, cost is three point seven million uh, eight fifty three. That covers the uh, that covers the agents and the and their and their operating cost. Uh, the toxicologist for that is one one million seventeen thousand two oh five. That covers the talk five toxicologists, and the cost for them is about a hundred thousand per scientist. That's salary plus benefits, and then the other remaining of that is for the toxicology supplies of one hundred twenty-five thousand, and then we need DNA biology supplies, and that's uh, three hundred and ninety-three thousand seven fifty. Okay, so the toxicologists are right around a hundred thousand dollars their salary, including benefits. Yes, sir. Okay. And what were the investigators? What were they around? They are the the cost for them is. With salaries forty eight five sixty four, plus fringe. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Representative Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Director. Thank you for being here. Uh, going back to the police officer shooting, um, obviously when. In, a, in my past life uh, as, a, as a federal mm -hmm. agent, we had thousands of, I worked internal affairs mm -hmm. for a while, and we had uh, thousands of people that we, we had to oversee and 
and investigate and had a number of, of shootings and that sort of thing. Um, we found a lot in our research when we, we, would, we would send a team in, not just one, we would send three. We had that luxury to be a psychologist, a person involved in a police officer shooting, a lead investigator. And we found such things in our, in our training and in our experience, such as not interviewing the officer right away because it would, with the events the way they were, uh, they had uh, difficulty in, in uh, processing that. Do you have a need, since this is increasing, and, and, I, and I applaud you for doing this good work, do you see a need for specialized training? Because it's a very complex area of the law. Uh, and it, do, are we fulfilling that following on Senator Williams' question? Do we need more funds for your training uh, to, to take care of those agents that are going to be doing this duty? Yes, sir. We, excellent question. We train every GBI agent on how to conduct the investigations because we're doing so many of them mm -hmm. and they're across the state. We also have a very structured process that we follow. We have an investigative manual that that dictates all the actions mm -hmm. of the supervisors, the involved agents, and the, and the people doing the death scene work. So it's a very structured process. In addition, we've been training local law enforcement officers over what to expect in a GBI investigation. Okay. And we've been doing this around the state because it's not a secret. It's just very, it's a very thorough process, but it's very stressful for everyone, everyone involved. Uh, we've, we, there is no margin for error in these type of cases. There's too much scrutiny, too, well, too, too high of expectation. I, for one, support you in doing it. I think it's a good, good role for you. Thank you. And Chairman Powell. Thank you. As a follow-up, after listening to uh, Senator Williams, Vernon, as I understood you right now, because we're being asked for 20 additional agents this year, and there'll be, while we know what they're going to be designated for, they'll still be across the board whenever they're needed. Yes, sir couple other areas and I heard you say 40 would be the appropriate number but what about our what about our forensic sciences not just the five toxicologists because you know to the people out there in TV land that are watching this you know y'all aren't uniform services y'all are the investigative the investigative branch of law enforcement y'all are the primo and with the the generalization of the crime scene investigation and all of that work Yes, sir. How many additional people? Because, you know, some of us who are we familiar need 15, with it. We needed 15 doc toxicologists 15. to handle the, handle the work. And next year we're going to need DNA scientists and we're going to need fingerprint scientists and firearm scientists. The, uh, we, the, the, the demands on the crime lab continue to increase. Uh, crime rate may be going down, but the demands for forensic science are going to continue to, to increase. Just one last follow-up question. In your division, since y'all are multifaceted, in your division of uh, handling the GCIC reporting, yes, sir. is all of that uh, being updated and kept instead with the increased number of uh, background checks primarily for people's Second Amendment rights for concealed weapons permit, or y'all... Yes, is, sir. is that division on top of things? We're, the, we're Georgia Crime Information Center, state of the art. We're fortunate in that we collect user fees, which pay for all this, so it helps. Turnaround is pretty quick to very, the local very, law. Very quick. Problem: if there's a delay in firearms license, it's not with GBI. We, we're, our turnaround is exactly hours is hours. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Keenan. Thank you, Ms. Buck, for coming. Appreciate your time here today. Uh, we need to move on to the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. Uh, we are running just a little bit behind schedule. Um, Jacqueline Bunn with Executive Director, Stephen Hatfield's Deputy Director, and I think Nathan Branson is here as well as the Chief Financial Officer. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, if we will, what we'll do in light of the, the schedule and the time, Again, we're just going to focus on your amended budget. And I think that's um, on page, page um, 136. 136. So if you 136 in your amended budget, you'll see the um, Criminal Justice Court any Council's request. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, the only change that we have is a $223 statewide change. That's it. Okay. Two hundred and twenty-three dollars. Two hundred and twenty-three dollars. <laughs> <laughs>
if, if you if you'll lead the way. <laughs> That's our only change. So, um, and just as a as by way of a as an introduction on the 17 budget, um, I noted that there was just the um, there was statewide increases that were accounted for in there, and your three percent increases. Um, with any other particular items that were of interest, just just to highlight them, so we'll look at it again when we come back. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the only thing that we can highlight is the general increases for the accountability courts and the juvenile justice programs. Okay. Those are the things that will be having the significant changes for 2017. Right, very good. Um, with the about six, seven minutes we have remaining, are there questions for the council? Um, the the grants that you're funding, um, how many of those grants are are funded in part by federal dollars? I'll let my deputy handle that one. About forty million of our budget is state grants. And then about the other 40 million or a little more are federal grants. And that is something that's increasing um, going forward in the federal grants. The Victims of Crime Act grant has seen a substantial increase, and we're actually phasing in that increase over the next three years to ensure that that funding is sustained on the federal level. And what is the horizon for the federal grants? Um, we, yeah, I think Mr. Chairman, the uh, federal grants typically run on a two to four year cycle. Uh, the larger grants, like the Victims of Crime Act, uh, which we see the largest incre increase in, runs on a four year cycle. Uh, most of our grants run at a three year, uh, on average, run at a three year expenditure rate. Um, in terms of state specific programs, we have uh, the accountability courts and juvenile justice are both supported by federal grants as well. The Veterans Court is a grant support the state accountability courts program as well with about $1.5 million over three years. Our juvenile justice programs are also supported by a, about a $1 million a year appropriation that spins out over two to three years. Thank you. Uh, any questions from members of the committee? Yes. Vice Chairman Hightower. And throughout our state, all the judicial districts, do most of those have accountability courts now? Most of them do. I think. I think all but four. All but four at this point. Do you know if they're coming online? I think. Uh, I'm hopeful that all of them will. We gave them a little bit of an incentive to do that last year. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. Okay. Just wanted to see if they were taking that initiative. Thank you. <laughs> Just. Um, in the increases for accountability courts, that is a call for 11 new courts that we anticipate to come online, and I think definitely in at least three of those districts. Awesome. Good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Director. We appreciate you being here. Um, and uh, if we'll, we'll move on to our next one. appreciate you again, your service, and thank you for um, being here today. If we have further questions for you in the 17 budget, we'll call you back. Thank you. And now we have the Department of Juvenile Justice. And Commissioner Niles. Thank you. And Sonia Allen Smith, our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you very much for being here this morning. <laughs> Good. Um, so let's get to our amended budget page here first. And that's going to be on 138 of your amended budget book and then I think we'll have time to try to go into the 17 budget with our remaining time today we'll see how that works out for us but on your big budget that's 264 page 264 of your big budget Commissioner Niles if you'll go ahead and lead us off appreciate you being here this morning thank you we, we thank you for allowing us uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice to address questions talk about our budget talk about facility growth facility sustainability as well as how do we stratify our system so 
on page 138 we will start and and there let me talk about the mile enclosure because in the budget you would see a lot of redirection what I call reinvestment of those funds from the facility that closed and we operated the Milan facility a con contract facility for a number of years and that budget cycle we budgeted for the full 12 months but we closed it in September of last year uh, due to the reduction in the number of kids that was coming into our system and we reinvested those funds that was already budgeted into the program in which we're here to discuss today overall budget uh, for the Milan facility was 7.2 million uh, we spent 1.2 million uh, those three months of operation the remaining six million of that was redirected reinvested into juvenile justice activities and facilities sustainment um, when you look at the the transfer on page 138 transfer from from secure facility which is the YDC uh, program to where we really really focusing in on treatment rehabilitation and getting the kids ready to transform back out into the community to make sure that the community is ready to receive the youth uh, we created in there with the two two point um, eight million for 40 step down beds and what that is staying in line with with juvenile justice reform under HB 242 so that the community is ready to receive those kids the various services uh, that our kids use mental health services out in the community um, substance abuse treatment <coughs> um, anger management anger retention out in the community that's what the 2.3 and then of course in the transfer from secure confinement or commitment the YDC program is a salary increase of two two hundred sixty six thousand um, dollars and this was for those hits unit for those kids that was leaving that needs a more structured supervision plan and those are the type or that's what a two two hundred sixty six thousand went to increase those salary for those kids uh, supervisors uh, probation officers parole officers out in the community um, we have vendors in place um, that that contain those kids those 40 or 50 kids in the step down units of that program that those benefits would go to the hits we are looking at 127 of our highest need kids to be supervised and that's 127 that that 266 will will go to toward is the um, salary increase continuing on your budget page on 248 you'll see the next page is for the teamwork and accounting uh, software and that's a statewide change uh, that that address throughout the entire state Mr. chair on page uh, 139 of your budget book you see other statewide adjustment in the teamwork uh, the next three items is that Milan that I spoke with or two earlier and it talks about the step down unit and facility sustainment some 1.863 um, in facility sustainment of course you, you have heard uh, that that our youth uh, our adult system our inmates that come into our system are getting more complex getting more dangerous and and when you look at some of our facilities our aging facilities we've got to keep up with the the, the wear, wear and tear on those particular facilities for instance the the, the lock mechanisms are being compromised by our kids that's coming in our systems and of course when you, you know when we put them inside we want to keep them inside and so when we look at that when you look at some of our facilities that's built in the late 60s and we're in 2016 you're dealing with a different class of youth that came in then compared to now so that facility sustainment plan uh, that covers all of the complex issues with the window dressings and and just the makeup and the sustainability of the facility the wear and tear of the facility 
back when I was at the sheriff's office some 21 years, um, I was in charge of one of the third largest jails in the state. And, and, and looking at the way that, that the jails are being built compared to the way that when I came here some four years ago, looking at how our kids are being treated inside those facilities. So when you look at facility sustainability, we've got to do better. And these funds that's allotted here will get us on the right track to do that. Continuing on page 139 in your budget book, um, you will see um, funding from that mile and redistribution, what I call reinvestment, is you'll see three facilities where, where we're looking at the director's housing. These are the three areas of our state that have the highest turnover for our, our heads of those particular facilities. It's hard to get people to move into those areas to commute when we need those officers or those directors to be on site for various things that happen inside the facility. We need that set of eyes. And these director housing um, and the governor's recommendation is to build those three houses on those complex uh, locations where we can have our directors to respond to those critical needs and critical incidents. And this is one way stepping in the right direction to maintain those particular directors uh, so that they'd be closer to the locations in which they are responding to. And then you'll see also, and, and that is the for the YDC, which is our long care facilities. Um, you'll see 1.257 in there for facility sustainability. And again, those are the facilities that are wearing out, um, literally wearing out. Um, continuing on page 139, you'll see the, the same statewide adjustment um, that, that happens in, in the previous slide. And on page 140 of your budget book, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, um, you'll see a net state fund change of $47,837. And that 47 is the Milan redistribution, what I call the reinvestment, uh, that, that between that it zeroes the net program. Uh, the 47,000 we received all for the statewide increases for the teamwork and accounting system. Um, the re redistribution of the Milan, of, again, that budget was $7.2 million. Um, we spent $1.2 million through uh, September of last year at that Milan, and that remaining $6 million was really, really focused in reinvestment on juvenile justice reform. And that concludes my presentation under the amendment, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Thank you. I uh, appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, I think it's clear that the investments uh, that have been made over the last five years uh, are paying off uh, as we continue to be a success story across the, the nation. Are there questions from committee members? Is that Representative Williams, I see? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Always good to see both of you. Thank you, sir. I'm just, Madam CFO, the last presenter needed $223, and you came off the bat with 266000 I realize what you're asking for, but in all seriousness, in your work and what you've seen, do you keep records that reflect on successes to the point? Who all is graduating to? Directive Keenan and others, and who's going out into the community and finding a straighter path? Right, and and, and that's a good um, a good question, sir. Uh, when you look at what good we do, it's not being told. Hmm. When when you look at when Governor Deal came in office, where where education was at one of the lowest levels that I can imagine when we took office. 
and the focus on all of your educational opportunities, the redirection, the refocus on education. We have, as a state agency, operating the 181st school district, have graduated more kids, provided for more opportunities, having kids that graduate from our system that's duly enrolled in college, as well as duly enrolled within our technical college system of Georgia, to where those kids leave us and not reoffend and go on to bigger and better things. An example of that is just we had graduation in de December of this year, our past year. Um, and and when, when I say a success, had a young lady that had, had did her full five years with DJJ. Hmm. Full five years. Left us on one day and enrolled to where she full, received a full academic scholarship to Alabama. Now, she was the valedictorian of our class graduation. That's a success. When we look at the success of, of juvenile justice reform, where you have your average daily population decreases, where we have more fulfillment of kids that's leaving us, going back home, and not getting in trouble. In the more hardcore, the way that we have set our systems up, the more hardcore kids that really, really need to be detained, not the ones we mad at, but the ones that we, we really, really are afraid of. Those are the ones that impact in our system, who's impacting where Vernon gets involved, where Homer Bryson gets involved, mm -hmm. compared to at some point in time, there, there's hope. And, and, and I believe DJJ, with the leadership of the governor, is in better position to make sure that not only the kids are better, but their families are better. And of course, all of us know when the family is better, Mm -hmm. The community is better. And now, when the community is better, Georgia is better. And those are the type of things that we're, we strive for and set out. Follow up, Representative Williams. Any, any follow up? Okay. That's wonderful. I'll just say, let the church say amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, to, but to follow up on the Representative's question, I, I think that the, the success data is important. In yes. other words, I, I think I think what I heard Representative Williams asking was, you know, what data do you have? I think you have a good story to tell, but it's also very helpful to have that information. I think we've talked about this before of having yes, those success, the, the graduation rates before and after. Um, yes. We've seen the juvenile justice reform. Um, now, bearing in mind the the the. The, the testing pool has changed because what we're doing is we're having more yes. kids moving back to home, yes. back home so that may be a little mm -hmm. different than what you might expect but it would be helpful to see that and start tracking that to see what success the education programs are having I think it's heartfelt in this committee and in, in, in the General Assembly as a whole that that um, if you are able to try to provide young people with education and the motivation to see yes, the sir. benefits of education yes then your likelihood of seeing them progress and 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 not and deviate back to the straight and narrow yes uh, is is going to be a greater uh, greater percentage and a greater likelihood so yeah. uh, I think that we it would be helpful to us to see what those results are because I know that you're working hard I know that you're also experiencing uh, folks where you've got teachers that are having to travel to centers and and teach. Um, and they're passing through other school systems where it might be easier to get a job there, uh, lower commute, uh, maybe even more money. Um, so I know that, that is a struggle that your department is facing, but um, I think the endeavor to educate the population as before they become, before they graduate, unfortunately, to you know, to um, a life of crime, we want to stop that yes, at this point and and have them be successful Georgians. Um, so we appreciate that work too. The, Senator C, did you have a question? It was a quick question. Am I correct in assuming that these kids that we are reaching, the success stories, that we are engaging them in technology? Because technology is ever evolving, and I recognize that. So, you know, 
would you elaborate on that? Yes, well? ma'am. And, and of course, uh, through the, the good work of, of the leadership of the governor and this great assembly, we have been fortunate enough to catch up, not pass, but catch up with technology as it relates to providing the tools that our kids need to be successful when they reintegrate uh, from, and I use the terminology as trans relocate. Mm. Relocating from a system that upright them so that they can be better off inside the community with, with, with technology enhancement, such as some of our kids have never touched a iPad. Mm. And, and, and we would be doing this justice to those kids and trying to provide an opportunity to them when they can't keep up with their fellow classmates. So we have, through your support, introduced uh, technology enhancements such as the Kindles so that those guys and girls that's in our system can keep up now. They can't go searching the internet. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, but but we do provide them with classroom materials. We provide them with smart boards. Our classroom for its technology, you look walk in some of our classroom, thanks to you all, they look just like a traditional classroom with smart boards. Our technology enhancement, <clears throat> when a kid transferred to us from the school system in which they came, or transferred from us out, we mash a button and that record is transferred. We're getting, in, getting ready to uh, enter into a system, and I have our director of education with it, Dr. Amistad, uh, transfer into a system so that those parents, regardless of where the kid is, they can click and do the, the Google search or, or through a controlled environment so that they can get daily reports as it relates to their child sitting in our care. And that's how we keep the parents involved. So those are technology enhancements so that when that kid trends relocate from us to the community, they are better off than the way that they came. Thank you. Representative Williams. Very quickly, and thank you for that question, Senator Zika. And you, you answered something, and <clears throat> I know bureaucratically it can get a little tough, but you're talking about kids who've never touched an iPad. There's so many people, I'm not one of them. When, when I'm through, you really have to work on an iPad. But moves with every generation. Yes, sir. Have you ever thought about a program of, of, of contributing iPads and Kindles? I've got a Kindle I don't even use that could be contributed to the department. I'll bet yes. you there are people all over the state that would be glad to give what they would normally trade in or just right. set aside. Right. And, and that's an excellent idea, and it's one in which we will make sure that we see what kind of availability and resources that one could land because there's a need okay. for every kid to have and to keep up with technology. Okay. <clears throat> I think it's another great way the community can kind of get involved. Um, you know, the, the earlier the earlier we can get involved in uh, redirecting individuals, um, hopefully before they get into DJJ's supervision, but before then would be even better. But um, I want to thank you very much for both of you coming today. We we are on a tight schedule with the session opening um, this week at 10 a.m. Um, we'll cover the 2017 budget later. Uh, I wanted to make sure we had enough time for questions over the 16 amended and to cover other topics that are of interest to members of the committee. But thank you very much for coming, Commissioner Niles. Yes, sir. Um, CFO, thank you so much for being here. We are really pleased to have you. Um, and we'll see you again in a few weeks for 17. Yes, sir. And at this time, since our this is my committee has actually <laughs> decided to, 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 to adjourn anyway. Um, uh, I, by virtue of the feet walking out, we're adjourned. <laughs>